بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ہیلو اینڈ ویلکم ٹو لیکچر نمبر ٹین آف الجبرائک ٹوپالوجی اور ٹوڈیز ٹاپک آف ڈسکیشن از سمپلیشل ہمالوجی سو دس از فرسٹ لیکچر ان دا چین آف سمپلیشل ہمالوجی اور ان جنرل ویل بی ڈسکسنگ ہمالوجی سو ان دس لیکچر وی ول ڈسکس وٹ آر سمپلیکسز وٹ آر سمپلیشل کمپلیکسز اینڈ دین ایٹ دی اینڈ وی ول سی وٹ آر ٹرائنگولیشن سو ٹرائنگولیشن آف اسپیس از یوزڈ to calculate the homology of a space. So why homology? So uh, we know that in algebraic topology what we are trying to do, so we are trying to take one uh, topological space and we are trying to associate some algebraic structure, for example group with that topological space and using the properties of that algebraic structure. We are going to discuss we are going to uh, analyze the topological properties of the space so that's uh, uh, the major theme of this subject uh, so far uh, we have discussed uh, one such map of uh, so map that will map topological spaces with groups so of course uh, you know this is fundamental group okay so uh, the fundamental group uh, what does fundamental group do so uh, basically we are discussing uh, the homotopy classes or path classes of loops uh, in a space now we already uh, know that fundamental group of sn for n greater than or equal to 2 is trivial so in other words uh, we can say that uh, if we are discussing low dimensional spaces for example sphere or torus or other uh, surfaces with genus let's say two three or higher genus surfaces then fundamental group is very useful because we are discussing low dimensional spaces in this case just two dimensional surfaces okay so uh, but if we go to higher dimensional uh, spaces uh, like uh, uh, n spheres then uh, the fundamental group can't distinguish between these two so for example a fundamental group can't distinguish between uh, s 10 and s 11 because we know that both these topological spaces have the same fundamental group okay so the fundamental group is not a good choice uh, for higher dimensional spaces so what do we do uh, basically uh, we go to higher dimensions uh, we go to higher homotopy groups pi n of x but uh, uh, with these pi n of x there is a serious drawback so what is that drawback that they are extremely difficult to calculate okay so uh, as an alternate to these uh, higher homotopy groups we have homology groups so uh, as compared to higher homotopy groups the homology groups are uh, more computable so as compared to the higher homotopy groups we can easily ca calculate them uh, of course we will uh, see that they are not as easy as uh, our other calculations in mathematics uh, but uh, uh, they are simpler than calculating the higher homotopy groups so unfortunately uh, to be able to compute homology groups one needs to understand some technical machinery an interesting feature of uh, homology is that when you get used to the technical details then you realize that the properties of homology are much more uh, used than the actual definition of homology so uh, for example if you even know the definition of uh, homological groups or uh, some homology group then uh, uh, it's almost impossible uh, to calculate or to apply the that definition to calculate uh, uh, the homology groups okay so apart from simple cases of course so what we do is we uh, use other properties of uh, uh, homology and those properties are much more used than the actual definition of course uh, we derive those properties by using the definition so definition has its own uh, uh, importance of course uh, but uh, we derive other properties using that definition and of course other results of topology and algebra and we, we use those properties and they are much more helpful than the actual definition so our main aim is to study uh, singular homology uh, but uh, to get adaptive to the homology we begin with a mild version of it called simplicial homology okay so uh, this is uh, somehow a, a, a simplification of the sim singular homology 
so the main idea is to triangulate the space uh, under consideration which will help us in calculating the homology of such spaces uh, this will help us in giving a presentation of the fundamental group as well okay so in simplicial homology we mainly deal with the simplicial complex okay so uh, first we will see uh, what are simplicial complexes and then uh, we will see uh, how to relate this to the word triangulate okay so the main idea is given any space triangulate it and uh, calculate the homology but uh, in in this uh, triangulation where this word is simplicial complex stand we will see in today's lecture so uh, we already know that what is an n simplex so this is basically uh, n dimensional generalization of a triangle in the plane okay so triangle is in the plane and we have now uh, n simplex which is uh, generalization of that triangle a simplicial complex is topological space which can be decomposed as a union of simplices uh, as an example of uh, a simplicial three complex uh, we can see this thing so uh, you can see that uh, so we we already know uh, that a point is also a simplex uh, of course and uh, uh, this line segments are also uh, simplices and this triangle and this tetrahedron and uh, we put them together and we get a simplicial complex so that's the uh, rough uh, idea of a simplicial complex so you get uh, uh, simplices of uh, arbitrary dimension so in this case zero dimension one dimension two dimension three dimension okay so uh, you get these simplices and uh, then uh, you put them together and you get a simplicial complex so uh, this section is going to be a, a recall of our uh, uh, concept of simplex so uh, to construct simplex uh, we need a finely independent point so what are a fine independent points so uh, a set of m plus 1 points is a fine independent if p1 minus p0 p2 minus p0 pm minus p0 is linearly independent subset of the real vector space rn okay so uh, next if we have m plus uh, 1 uh, points which are a fine independent uh, then the convex set spanned by this set is denoted by this is called the m simplex with vertices p1 p2 p0 p1 p2 up to pm so uh, what is uh, the convex set spanned by this set so it means that uh, the smallest convex set containing these points uh, but uh, given this definition uh, it will be complicated uh, to calculate uh, uh, the convex spat set spanned by this thing so we have uh, the following theorem which uh, greatly simplifies uh, this idea of convex set spanned by some collection of points so it says that you just have to take uh, this combination uh, t i p i and p i are the points uh, spanning this convex set okay so namely this uh, m simplex so uh, just take these combinations and uh, uh, there is a condition on the coefficients that uh, the sum of the coefficients should be equal to 1 and each ti should be greater than or equal to 0 so uh, if you remember these pi's are points of some euclidean space rn so now we are in rn and we are taking these combinations okay so uh, so for example if i take p not to be equal to 100 0, 0 in r3 in particular and p1 is equal to 0 1 0 and uh, p2 is equal to 0 0 1 and uh, then the two simplex generated by these three points uh, is basically going to be a combination of the points t1 p0 plus sorry t0 p0 t1 p1 plus t2 p2 okay so uh, these combinations but there is a condition on these ti's okay so the condition is that uh, t1 plus t2 plus t0 should be equal to 1 and all the ti's are also greater than or equal to 0 so with these uh, conditions uh, you can uh, easily see that that this is going to be uh, a convex set and uh, because uh, this is set of all uh, line segments joining p0 p1 p2 and then of course uh, uh, the points containing this so for example this is p0 this is p1 this is p2 so 
the convex set containing this point must contain this line, this line, and this line. So uh, when these lines are contained, then of course this is another point in this space, this is another point, so the line segment joining them should also be contained in this. So all these uh, line segments uh, should also be contained in this. So basically we get this set which is the solid triangle and uh, this solid triangle is the two simplex generated by these three points. So uh, if we don't impose these conditions, so if we ignore, if we ignore these conditions, so let's ignore them. Okay, so what is this? T naught, P naught plus T1, P1 plus T2, P2. So these Ti's of course are uh, real numbers. So under this condition, so this will generate the whole R3. Okay, because uh, these are three points and we know from uh, vector spaces, so we know from the study of vector spaces that this is a three dimensional vector space generated by these three points and these three points gen generate the whole R3. Okay, but if we impose the condition on the coefficients and uh, then we will just get a triangle. Okay, so uh, if, you, if you try to see this triangle then this triangle will be something like this. So this is P naught, P1, P2. So the triangle containing these three points is going to be this. So basically this face, this is the triangle. So this triangle is basically uh, the, so this is the point on this axis. So uh, this is the triangle which is the two simplex generated by this P0, P1 and P2. Okay. So uh, in this example you can see what is a zero simplex, of course a zero simplex is just uh, uh, one point so and uh, what is a one simplex it will be generated by two points, a two simplex will be generated by three points, a three simplex will be generated by four points and uh, a typical example of a three simplex is given as a tetrahedron. Okay, so uh, P0 is a zero simplex and uh, one simplex is this. So uh, why this expression? Uh, because we know that P0, T0, P0 plus T1, P1. Okay, but there is a condition that T0 plus T1 should be equal to 1 and all the Ti's should be greater than or equal to 0. So this implies that T1 is equal to 1 minus T0. Okay, so I can write this down as T0, P0 plus 1 minus T0 P1. So T0 uh, is uh, varying on the whole real line so I can just change it to T. So 1 minus T P1 where T varies through R. Okay, And uh, of course uh, these Ti's are greater than or equal to 0. So uh, in other words I am just saying that this T is greater than or equal to 0. So uh, with these conditions on uh, Ti's, so uh, we can uh, easily see that uh, this T varies from 0 to 1 because uh, T naught is greater than or equal to 0, okay, but uh, also uh, T1 is equal to 1 minus T naught. So when uh, T naught is bigger than 1, then uh, this will be a negative number. So we don't want that, so that's why this t must be varying from 0 to 1. Okay, so what is this expression now? So this expression is line segment from P0 to P1. So if we take t is equal to 0, then I will be getting P1 and uh, when I am taking t is equal to 1, then I will be getting P0. So it's a basically line segment, okay, so it should be a straight line. So uh, it is line segment from P1 to P0. So that's why the one simplex or uh, uh, the simplex generated by these two points P0, P1 is the line segment joining P0 and P1. Now uh, what is a two simplex? We have already seen an example of a two simplex where we have taken uh, this P0, P1, P2 to be the coordinate points of R3 and uh, it was a triangle. So with vertices P0, P1, P2.
the three simplex P0, P1, P2, P3 uh, is the solid tetrahedron. So solid tetrahedron means it also includes uh, points inside the tetrahedron. Okay. So the triangular face opposite PI consists all those points whose barycentric coordinate is uh, 0. Okay. So, uh, so for example, uh, this is the point, let's say P0, this is P1, P2, P3. Okay. So uh, this is the tetrahedron. Now, uh, if we consider this face, which is opposite to P0, uh, then uh, it, it has barycentric coordinates. So what are the barycentric coordinates? So if we go back to uh, this theorem, then these Ti's are barycentric coordinates. Okay. So uh, of course, uh, P0 doesn't have any contribution uh, in this phase, which is uh, at the floor of this tetrahedron. And so uh, of course, uh, this will be a collection of all points with the T1, P1, T2, P2, plus T3, P3. And of course, uh, the rest of the conditions are there on the Ti's, but there is no uh, P0 here. So the barycentric coordinate of P0 is 0. Okay, so similarly, we can find other faces uh, of a simplex. So what is a face of a simplex? Uh, given any simplex, uh, the face opposite Pi is basically uh, take all the combinations, but uh, uh, just take out this Pi from these combination okay so we are taking the combinations uh, but uh, don't include this pi in other words the barycentric coordinates of this pi are zero so this hat means that pi is excluded from this uh, combination from this uh, uh, set so when i take uh, this uh, variation of j then uh, this i will not be included so basically j is not equal to i of course, uh, these uh, Tj's are greater than or equal to 0 and this Ti in particular. So the coefficient of this Pi is 0. So uh, the boundary of uh, this M simplex is the union of its faces. Uh, so for example, consider this uh, tetrahedron and we know that tetrahedron uh, is a 3 simplex uh, generated by the points P0, P1, P2, P3. Then uh, there are, for example, this is one phase of the tetrahedron, this is the second phase, third phase, and the fourth phase. Okay, so one, two, three, four. These are the four phases. And if we take the union of these four phases, that will be the boundary of this uh, three simplex. So uh, if this is uh, P0, this is uh, P1, this is P3, this is P2. So how to write down the points on this phase P0, P1, P3, uh, of course there will be combinations uh, with the, the barycentric coordinates of P2 to be 0. In other words, there will be T0, P0 plus T1, P1 plus T3, P3. Similarly, uh, uh, consider this phase. So this is P0, this is P1, this is P2, this is P3. So how to write down this red phase of the tetrahedron. So uh, the points on this uh, red face of the tetrahedron can be obtained by taking the barycentric coordinates of P1 to be 0 and similarly the other faces. In general, uh, we can define a K phase. So for example, in this uh, three simplex, I have considered these two faces. Uh, so uh, two faces means uh, so uh, the faces which are two simplices. Okay. Now I can also consider these one faces. So this line segment, which is one simplex, is also a face of this tetrahedron. Similarly, this point is also a face of this tetrahedron. So in general, uh, we can define a K phase uh, for any M simplex. So K lies between 0 and M minus 1. So how to define it? So K simplex is spanned by K plus 1 uh, of the vertices. Uh, in this terminology, the faces that we defined above are m minus 1 faces because these are uh, for example in the case of tetrahedron if this is 3 simplex then these faces are 2 simplices okay so 3 minus 1 okay similarly uh, if we if we define uh, what are uh, one uh, 
one faces so one face are basically uh, the one simplices generated by p naught p1 p naught p2 p naught p3 p1 p2 p1 p3 p2 p3 so these are one two three four five six so six one faces and similarly what about zero faces one two three four so it has four zero faces six one faces and once again four two faces so coming to our uh, today's lecture uh, linear ordering of a simplex and orientation of a n simplex is a linear order ordering of its vertices okay so for example uh, consider is two simplex e not e1 e2 okay so let's say this is e not this is e1 this is e2 and orientation of this two simplex is e not is less than e1 is less than e2 okay this orientation gives one counterclockwise tour of the triangle so starting from this e not we are going to e1 and then e2 and then go back to e not so basically we have taken one complete tour of this uh, uh, two simplex okay so uh, but uh, this gives tour of the vertices so consider another ordering e1 e2 e0 so in other words starting from e0 goes to e2 e2 goes to e0 e0 goes to e1 so once again uh, these two tours are same okay so consider this ordering and consider this ordering these two uh, seems like different ordering but they are giving me the same tour of the vertices so e0 goes to e1 goes to e2 goes to e0 so the same tour and in general uh, in this case uh, we can say that these three orderings okay gives me the same tour uh, of this uh, two simplex uh, and of course i can give another ordering and uh, if i want to give another ordering of this two simplex and uh, which will be different from this then uh, of course i need to take a clockwise tour so in other words e0 okay so this is e0 e1 e2 so e0 goes to e2 goes to e1 okay so now we are going in this direction okay so this is the clockwise uh, clockwise tour of this two simplex and similarly we can see that these three orderings gives me the same tour of the two simplex so what we have defined we have defined an orientation in a n simplex and what is an orientation it is just ordering of the vertices so uh, e not less than e1 less than e2 is an ordering of the three vertex so ordering means we have say uh, we have uh, defined the order such that e not is less than e1 e1 is less than e2 okay so this is an ordering of the vertices orientation of faces so uh, given an orientation of an n simplex there is an induced orientation of its faces defined by the orienting the ith face in the following sense so here the negative sign in interpreted as follows so uh, if there is a negative sign with this uh, uh, n simplex and e i is removed uh, then it has the orientation opposite to this okay so for example if i have this uh, two simplex e not e1 e2 so when i'm saying two simplex it means the solid triangle okay so given an ordering of the vertices in other words given an orientation of this two simplex okay so e not e1 e2 okay so uh, if i if i take negative sign with this then it means that instead of going e not to e1 to e2 i'm going in the opposite way i'm going e not e2 e1 okay so basically this will be a clockwise uh, orientation this with this negative sign but uh, without this uh, negative sign e not e1 e2 
So in this case, E0 goes to E1 goes to E2 goes to E0. So this is a counterclockwise. But if I add a negative sign, then this will be a clockwise. So in other words, I am reversing the orientation. Okay, so I'm just reversing the orientation of this. So orientation, so with this negative sign, this has the orientation opposite to that of this. Okay, so uh, how to define the orientation of a face? So we just add minus 1 raised to power i and remove that vertex. Okay, so uh, if I want to calculate uh, the orientation of the face opposite to E0, so what do I do? So I remove, okay, so given E0, E1, E2, okay, so uh, if, I, if I remove this E1, then uh, the face opposite to E0, okay, uh, will have the following orientation. So minus 1 raised to power 1, E0, E2, which means that uh, this is minus E0, E2. So in this case, you can see that E0 goes to E1 goes to E2, E0 goes to E1 goes to E2. So this is the orientation of this two simplex. Uh, but uh, if I remove this E1, okay, so after removing this E1, what is the orientation between E0 and E2? Of course, in this case, E2 goes to E0, but not E0 goes to E2. So basically, it should be E2 e0 okay so because that's the orientation from e2 to e0 okay so uh, but uh, e0 e2 without this negative sign e0 e2 is, uh, is basically orientation from e0 to e2 which is not the case so we needed this negative sign okay so which is basically equal to the following ordering e2 e0 okay so uh, which is uh, which we can also see that uh, we need this negative sign uh, if we want to get our orientation right. So let's state this example precisely. So if we have a two simplex E0, E1, E2, so when we write this simplex, uh, it comes with the following orientation E0, E1, E2. Now the zeroth phase of uh, this uh, two simplex, is, so zeroth phase means when we remove this E0 or the face opposite to E0. So basically this face. So this is a one simplex and we want to know what is the orientation of this one face. So according to our definition, this should be equal to minus one to power zero and remove this E0 and uh, we get E1, E2. Okay, so uh, we, we see that uh, in this orientation, so E0 goes to E1, E1 goes to E2, E2 goes to E0. So in this orientation, if we remove this E0, then the orientation is from E1 to E0, E2. So that's what we get in this case. Similarly, if we remove this E1, so after removing this E1, our face is opposite to E1 is this face. Okay. Now we want to get the orientation of this face. Okay. So the orientation of, so the orientation of uh, this face should be from E2 to E0 because that's where our arrow is. So uh, let's see. According to this formula, so this is equal to minus 1 is to power 1, E0, E1 removed, E2, which is equal to minus 1, E0, E2, which is equal to E2, E0, which is exactly the orientation that we get from this uh, picture. So which means that the face is oriented from E2 to E1. Now, uh, similarly, we can find uh, that if we remove E2, okay, so E0, E1, E2, so the face opposite to E2 is basically this face, okay. So the orientation of this should be from E0 to E1. Uh, let's see what we get from this formula. So the, f the orientation of the face opposite to E2 is minus 1 raised to power 2 because if we are removing the ith, uh, vertex then we should take minus 1 is to power i so minus 1 is to power 2 e0 e1 e2 removed so this is equal to e0 e1 okay so uh, we can see that this is exactly what we get so the orientation of this face is e0 to e1 now what is the boundary of uh, this two simplex so this is equal to 
E1, E2, union E0, E2, union E0, E1. So basically union of these three uh, one simplexes is basically all boundary. Okay, so union of these three uh, one simplexes. Okay, so the oriented boundary of uh, this two simplex is given by this. So of course uh, uh, in the oriented boundary uh, we should take the union of uh, these one simplices together with their orientation. So in other words uh, we want to write E0, E1. Okay, so in this direction and then I want to write E1, E2, union E1, E2. Then I want to write E2, E0, union E2, E0. So let's see if it's the same as this. So E1, E2, so E1, E2, it's there, minus E0 to E2 means E2 to E0. So it's there. Similarly, E0 to E1, E0 to E1, it's there. Okay, so that's the oriented boundary. So the boundary with the orientation, because uh, when I'm writing E2, E0, it's different from E0, E2, because uh, uh, this says that uh, this one simplex is oriented from E2 to E0. And uh, the simplex, uh, if, uh, if I write the simplex E0 to E2, then this means it is oriented from E0 to E2. Okay, so this is the oriented boundary of the one simplex. In general, if we are given any n simplex, uh, then we can define the boundary by taking uh, the union of uh, its uh, n minus 1 uh, subsimplices, or in other words, uh, the union of its faces. And uh, if I want to get uh, the oriented boundary of del n, then I want to add these minus 1 raised to power i's as well, uh, just to uh, take. Uh, care of the orientation of the boundary vertex set so given any q simplex we can define its vertex set as uh, given to be so v1 v0 up to vq so uh, basically uh, in this notation so the q simplex generated by these q plus 1 points so all of these q plus 1 points are the vertices of that q simplex so for example, given this two simplex, uh, its vertex set is E0, E1, E2. A proper face. So uh, if S is a simplex and S prime be a face of S, uh, then if vertex set of S prime is contained in vertex set of S, we denote this by S prime is less than or equal to S. And if S uh, prime is strictly less than S, that is vertex set of S prime is contained, properly contained in vertex set of S, then S prime is called proper face of S. So uh, in particular, uh, let's say I'm given a tetrahedron. Let's say this is E0, E1, E2, E3. Uh, then the vertex set of this uh, three simplex, let's say Q, is equal to E0, E1, E2, E3. Uh, similarly, uh, if I take this uh, two face okay so uh, let's say this is uh, p which is uh, the two face generated by e1 e2 e3 uh, then the vertex uh, set of uh, this p is equal to e1 e2 e3 okay so let's say this is s prime and let's say this is s we can see that okay so this is s so we can see that s prime is properly contained in uh, S prime or basically uh, we can uh, see that uh, the set of vertices of uh, this uh, two simplex P is properly contained in this because there is one element in S which is E naught which is not in there so we can say that this is proper face of this of course uh, if I take Q uh, which is again E naught E1 E2 E3 uh, then uh, the vertex set of this Q is uh, uh, of course equal to the vertex set of Q so we can say that this uh, three simplex which is the tetrahedron is also a face of itself uh, but this is not the proper face okay. so coming to our uh, next important section of today's lecture uh, simplicial complex 
So a finite simplicial complex K is a finite collection of simplices in some Euclidean space, but not just any collection of uh, uh, simplices. Uh, so they have to follow some conditions. So what are the conditions? So if uh, S belongs to K, then every face of S is also belonging to K. Similarly, if I have uh, two uh, uh, simplices S and T belongs to K, then their intersection is either empty or a common face of S and T. So, uh, for example, uh, if I take uh, this first example, uh, which is a simplicial complex. So, why it is a simplicial complex? So, uh, let's say this is S, this is T, then uh, their intersection is this point, uh, which is basically uh, a common face of S and T. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, this S and let's say this is uh, R. So this S and R intersects at this point, which is a common face of S and R. Similarly, this R and let's say this is L. So they intersect at this point, which is the common face of R and L. So now uh, consider this second example. So why this is not a simplicial complex? Uh, because if I take this to be S and uh, this two simplex, uh, which uh, means that uh, uh, it is the solid uh, triangle okay so uh, the intersection of s and t is this uh, line segment okay uh, but this is not the common face of s and t because uh, this small portion is not a face of s okay so it is a one simplex s is a one simplex so uh, the one face of s is itself this line segment and the zero face is this point and this point and this line segment is not a face of s so that's why uh, this is not so this small portion is not a face of s so that's why s intersection t is not a fa common face of s and t so th according to the second condition this is not a simplicial complex so consider another example now uh, we have uh, union of one two three and four one simplices okay so uh, take four one simplices and put them put them together in this way now uh, let's say this is s and let's say this is t1 so uh, the common face of s and t is this point which is uh, of course uh, uh, so the intersection of s and t1 is this point which is common face of s and t1 similarly uh, the common face of s and t2 is this which is the intersection of them and uh, similarly we can see that this t1 and t3 the intersection at this point which is the common face t1 t3 intersect at this point which is the common face and similarly this point okay so it satisfies all the conditions and uh, if s belongs to k then every face of s is also an element of k so uh, if uh, we have uh, uh, this uh, combination of lines uh, then we can easily see that this point which is a face of s and this point which is a face of s is also uh, inside k Okay, so that's how we define. So what are we trying to do? We are taking uh, some sort of special union of uh, simplices uh, in such a way that these two conditions are satisfied. Consider uh, two simplices uh, ABC and DEF. And uh, they have the following formation. Now what about S intersection T? So this is a two simplex, okay, generated by three points. This is a two simplex, so basically it's this solid triangle. Similarly, this is the solid triangle. Okay, so uh, what about their intersection? So their intersection is this point D, and uh, we can easily see that this D is not a face of this triangle ABC. Okay, so this D is face of uh, uh, this triangle DEF because this is a zero face of this thing. So it's a two simplex so it has uh, one faces which are these three uh, borders uh, border lines and uh, this one point which is a zero simplex okay so it's a, a zero face of this uh, two simplex but this point is not a face of the triangle or the two simplex abc so the following formation is not a simplicial complex vertex set of a simplicial complex uh, let k be a simplicial complex the vertex set of k denoted by this is the set of all zero simplices of k so uh, for example uh, in this case if we 
take this uh, two simplex add one simplex with it and uh, let's say add another two simplex with it so when I'm saying two simplex it means this solid triangle and this means this solid triangle I can take another line I can take another union of three one simplices so E1 E2 E3 E4 E5 E6 E7 E8 E9 okay is this a simplicial complex so the first thing is if s belongs to k then every face of s is also an element of k so uh, we can see that if uh, we have a complex uh, inside this k then every face is also an element of k the second condition uh, is that the intersection is either empty or a common face of s and t so we can see that the intersection is either empty or it is the common face between them okay so what is the vertex set of this simplicial complex of course this is e naught okay so there is no e naught so starting from e1 and e2 up to so on e9 okay so this is the vertex set of this uh, simplicial complex k underlying space of simplicial complex okay so if we forget about uh, uh, these points and regard and we forget that these are zero simplices and we forget that these lines are one simplices just take all the points on this line so in other words forget the uh, simplicial complex structure or forget the simplex structure okay then this underlying space uh, in the Euclidean space so basically uh, this uh, simplicial complex lives in some uh, Euclidean space so maybe in higher dimensions or in R3 or in R4 okay so uh, if we have a simplicial complex then its underlying space denoted by this uh, mod k is the space of the ambient space okay so basically we are taking union of uh, these simplices okay so uh, once again uh, we are just taking it as a subset of the Euclidean space so for example uh, if I have this triangle if I have uh, this vertex at E0 E1 E2 and let's say there's another vertex let's say E3 then uh, this is a simplicial complex okay so uh, for example uh, take it as a union of 1 2 3 and 4 so take it as a union of 4 one simplices okay but uh, uh, now it has a structure it has this middle point it has these end points th which are the vertices of the triangle but uh, if I take I its underlying space okay so let's say this is simplicial complex K then mod of K is just this triangle so we forget about this E3 we forget that uh, these line segments are simplicial complex so just these just this triangle and uh, not the uh, just this hollow triangle because uh, this is just union of four one simplices so inside of it is not contained in k okay so in, in fact k is a compact subspace of some ambient euclidean space so we can use a uh, hein borel theorem uh, to see easily that this is a, a compact subspace because uh, this is closed as well as bounded so what is the difference between uh, this simplicial complex K and uh, mod of K? Uh, so consider these two simplicial complexes K1 and K2. So uh, this is union of uh, three uh, one simplices and this is union of one, two, three, four, five, six. So six one simplices and uh, there are many, many, many vertices. But the underlying space of them is equal because these are just two triangles. So if we forget about the simplicial complex structure and just take the underlying space, then uh, this these are equal. Otherwise, uh, as a simplicial complex, they are completely different spaces. Triangulation. A topological space X is a polyhedron if there exists a simplicial complex K and a homeomorphism H from mod of k to x okay so we have already seen that mod of k is a 
compact subspace of some Euclidean space. So it's a topological space and uh, X is also a topological space so we can talk about homeomorphism between them. And if there exists a simplicial complex K such that uh, there exists a homeomorphism uh, from the underlying space of this, that simplicial complex 2X then this pair is called triangulation of X. Now uh, consider a simplicial complex K1 which is a union of three one simplices such that these simplices form a triangle so uh, it contains three zero simplices and uh, of course uh, this uh, mod of K1 uh, is parameter of a triangle. If X is equal to S1 uh, choose three distinct points A0, A1, A2 from this uh, unit circle and define the following homeomorphism. So the homeomorphism takes uh, E2 to A2, E0 to A0 and takes E1 to A1. Okay. So uh, also what about the other points? So the other points goes to uh, the unit circle in the following way. So uh, this triangle will fit inside this circle in this way and uh, the other points, so for example this point will go to this point at the boundary, this point will go to this point at the boundary, this point will go to this point at the boundary and similarly uh, we can uh, uh, find a continuous function which will take these points at the boundary of this triangle and uh, they will go to the points at this unit circle. So in other words uh, this uh, EI EI plus 1 uh, so this goes to the arc joining AI AI plus 1. Then this KH is a triangulation of S and has, hence this circle S1 is a polyhedron. For general Sn minus 1 we have the following thing. If K is a family of all proper faces of an N simplex. So we denote this simplicial complex by S dot then there exists a triangulation kh of sn minus 1. So if you see that uh, basically these are all faces, these are all proper faces of a 2 simplex. So if you take all proper faces of a 2 simplex you get a triangulation of s1. So if uh, you want to get triangulation of sn minus 1 then uh, you want to take all proper faces of an n simplex which is basically generated from n plus 1 points. Consider two simplices S and T and uh, they have the following formation. Their intersection S intersection T is D but D is not a face of S so the following formation is not a simplicial complex. Okay, So this is not a simplicial complex. Uh, the space X which is equal to uh, the underlying space of S union the underlying space of T is a polyhedron and can be triangulated using a simplex. Okay, So uh, forget about the uh, simplices forget about the simplex structure of uh, this union of uh, triangles so consider the underlying space okay so this is the underlying space uh, we forget that they have vertices we forget that they have mm, these lines are one simplices so just these two triangles so it's a compact topological space and uh, this can be triangulated so how we can triangulate it so consider this simplex okay so uh, the, this is basically union of these uh, three triangles. So uh, basically uh, this is a solid triangle, this is a solid triangle. So consider this solid triangle, consider this solid triangle, consider this solid triangle and solid triangle and solid triangle. Okay. Uh, the simplex uh, together with the obvious homomorphism. So what is the obvious homomorphism? So uh, just we can take the identity uh, identity map because uh, these are exactly the same triangles uh, but we have just included this new vertex D and uh, instead of taking it as one two simplex we have taken it as union of two uh, two simplices and basically now this is collection of three uh, two simplices so one two and three which is a K simplex because it will which is uh, a, a simplicial complex uh, so because uh, it satisfies all the conditions of the simplicial complex and uh, the homeomorphism between them is the identity map. So consider a four simplex 
uh, now consider the following simplicial complex obtained from this four simplex okay so uh, in this simplicial complex we have taken uh, the union of all of its proper and improper faces so uh, these are all proper faces the zero faces then one faces so all these one faces and then these uh, two faces and then this is improper phase which is the tetrahedron itself uh, so uh, it's just collection of proper and improper faces of the four simplex we can define a map H from the underlying space K to S K which is identity map hence a homeomorphism so the space K is a polyhedron so in other words uh, we can say that uh, the tetrahedron the solid tetrahedron is a polyhedron or it can be triangulated so in general every Q simplex uh, determines a simplicial complex K namely the family of all proper and improper faces of S and the underlying space of K is S and so we can define identity map hence a homeomorphism so K is a polyhedron or K can be triangulated so every N simplex or Q simplex can be triangulated in this way let's recall another thing from our previous lectures so if we have a topological space and if X prime is a partition of X uh, then we can define a quotient topology with the help of this okay so in particular we have seen that given any equivalence relation on this topological space then we can define uh, the the partition of X to be the equivalence classes of that equivalence relation and we can define the quotient topology okay so uh, as an example of uh, this uh, equivalence relation we have taken this X to be I cross I in other words just this square and uh, we can define this equivalence relation as the following so identify uh, this side with this side and uh, similarly identify this side with this side so if we do this identifications then uh, we get a torus so uh, in other words we can uh, say that uh, this square is basically a torus in some quotient topology of i cross i okay so if we take quotient of i cross i so in that quotient topology uh, this is a torus so uh, the shape in the diagram one is not a triangulation of torus so why it is not a triangulation of torus uh, because at the end th this is these are all going to be one vertex okay so these are not different vertices uh, because after this identification all of these points so these two points will go to these two points and then at the end uh, these all points will be joined so basically uh, we will get only one vertex so this is not a triangulation this is not a, a, a simplex so uh, there is no simplicial complex uh, with a homeomorphism to this thing because we have only one vertex okay and similarly uh, the shape in this diagram is not a triangulation of the torus so uh, I'm leaving it as an exercise to see why this is not a triangulation so at the end we get the following picture as the triangulation of the torus so uh, the shape in the diagram provides triangulation of torus the triangulation of the torus has 18 triangles 27 edges and uh, 9 vertices ok so these are 1 simplices now this is an interesting question that what is the minimum number of triangles required to triangulate a torus ok so is the answer 14 so this is the question mark or you can reduce this number by 1 more or 2 more Similarly, we can obtain a uh, Klein bottle by identifying edges of a square in the following way. So, this is a kind of uh, a rough sketch of uh, how a Klein bottle look like. So, uh, we are identifying uh, these two edges and we are identifying these two edges but in the opposite way. So, b basically we are uh, twisting them and then uh, combining them. Okay. So, uh, we can also triangulate this uh, Klein bottle. Uh, we can also uh, triangulate this uh, real projective plane so when we will be calculating the homology of real projective plane uh, we will see its uh, precise definition but uh, at the moment we can say that this is collection of all lines in R3 
Okay, so the collection of all lines in R3 uh, can be represented by this disk, and then this uh, this can be uh, homeomorphic to. So this is homeomorphic to this square, and uh, basically we are triangulating. We can uh, triangulate uh, this real projective plane. Okay. So in general, uh, given any orientable surface, so uh, once again we will uh, see what is an orientable surface and uh, surface uh, of genus G, orientable surface of genus G. So it can be constructed from a polygon with four G sides. So using the same procedure, uh, but of course with some tricky uh, calculations and uh, some uh, uh, imagination we can see uh, that uh, if I want to get a surface orientable surface of genus G then uh, I can uh, identify sides of a 4G, uh, 4G polygon polygon with 4G sides and we will get that surface so for example a torus is a uh, genus 1 we see that we have seen that how to get this torus from a square and uh, to get uh, a surface of genus three, 2 and uh, for example to get a surface of genus 3 uh, we will have to identify sides of this polygon okay so uh, in general we have seen that any orientable surface mg can be triangulated now the interesting question could be what is the minimum number of triangles required to triangulate a surface of genus g okay so uh, i'm leaving this as an exercise maybe you can find a very clever answer of this question so next time we will continue uh, the simplicial homology and we will see how to actually calculate uh, the simplicial homology this is the end of the lecture thank you very much and Allah Hafiz